Hi, everyone. This is Shoshana Zatz from CIBHS. Welcome to the Small County Fiscal Leadership, or I'm sorry, Small County Fiscal TA webinar. Um, just a couple of things. We're recording this session and it will be posted on our website sometime next week. Um, the next one in this series is April 26th. Um, Mike will be stopping for questions along the way, so if you have questions, type them uh, into the question box uh, that you should see on your screen. And um, other than that, I will turn it over to Mike. Great. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, good morning. Um, what we're going to cover today is uh, mental health financial reporting, um, and more specifically, the two main reports that you folks prepare, which is the Medi-Cal Specialty Mental Health Cost Report, and then the um, MHSA Annual Revenue and Expenditure Report. And the goal isn't to go into a lot of really detail. Again, we've, you know, we've got an hour here, um, but to kind of give you some, some high-level overview of the, of the reports and processes and what goes into the reports, um, as well as talk about some of the issues that seem to be uh, coming up more recently with, with DHCS. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into uh, talking about the Medi-Cal Especially Mental Health Cost Report. But it, prior to doing that, I, I just wanted to kind of remind you, um, you know, how the Medi-Cal Especially Mental Health Reimbursement works. And again, it's, it's the counties that contract with the state, with DHCS, as the providers of uh, Especially Mental Health Services. Um, and it's the counties that are the mental health plans. Um, and then as the mental health plans, you're responsible for providing or contracting to provide all Medi-Cal, especially mental health services. And, and everything runs through the county mental health plan. Part of the reason I bring this up um, is because it, it really uh, shows the relationship is between the county and the state, and that the providers really don't have um, any sort of weight in that discussion. It's then up to the county mental health plan, like I said, to contract with providers. And so that relationship is county with providers. Um, but really, there is no relationship between the providers and the state. It's, it's all the county and the state. And so in terms of the reimbursement process, um, you're reimbursed a percentage of your actual expenditures, which are called your certified public expenditures, or CPE, um, based on the, the federal medical assistance percentage in effect during the, the time period and for the given Medi-Cal aid code. Um, and, and that works for almost all of the Medi-Cal, especially mental health services, the one uh, one off or the caveat to that is that we do have these fee for service Medi-Cal inpatient hospital services, um, which you see as managed care offsets to your 1991 realignment. Um, for those services, you should be approving the treatment authorization request, but DHCS themselves are paying the provider directly, um, and you're just seeing the match uh, come out of your um, 1991 realignment as a managed care offset. Uh, but everything else, you know, which is 90, probably 85, 90 percent of our reimbursement comes from counties incurring certified public expenditures. And then you're reimbursed an interim amount throughout the, the year based on approved serve Medi-Cal services and your interim billing rates. And so, again, you guys know you submit claims uh, based on the, the services that are provided. Um, if those claims get approved, you then get uh, paid based on an interim rate. And the interim rate for um, contract providers should be the amount that uh, you actually pay the, the contract provider. So in general, um, most mental health plans contract for treatment services on some sort of um, minute rate or daily rate or, or whatever that happens to be. So whatever you're paying, those providers, that should be your interim rate. The interim rates for county operated providers are intended to approximate your actual costs. Um, you know, you don't necessarily know those till you go through the cost report process. Uh, so you want to do your best to to estimate what those 
interim rates should be based on actual cost. And so what the state's done is set a maximum called the county maximum allowance or something like that, that is based on your most recent file cost report adjusted for inflation. That becomes the maximum rate they're going to let you um, claim at for interim rates. But uh, you could actually, if, if you don't think you're going to have costs that are that high, um, you could actually set interim rates below that amount. And so that's the interim rate process, and then you go through, and, and those interim amounts are reconciled with actual expenditures through the year-end cost report settlement process, and then you're audited um, for the cost reports to determine your final Medi-Cal entitlement. And those audits are required to occur within three years after settlement. So what, what is the real purpose of the Medi-Cal Specialty Mental Health Cost Report? Um, and really, again, it, by the title itself, Medi-Cal Specialty Mental Health Cost Report, the, the purpose is to determine the Medi-Cal entitlement, or the FFP, that each county um, is entitled to based on services delivered and costs incurred. Um, and so that is really, uh, really the basis. And, and again, it, you know, some folks you know, really focus again on these interim payments. And really the, the way I look at this, it, it's kind of like uh, taxes, where you have, you know, taxes withheld from every paycheck throughout the year, but you don't really know what your true tax liability is until you file your tax returns. It's the same sort of thing here. You set up and you're getting your interim payments based on your interim rates and, and services uh, but really, you don't know what you're entitled to until you um, actually complete the cost report. Uh, so that's why it's it's really important. And and again, this is all specified in our state plan, which is why we have this process. Um, so uh, it, it's not something that's, um, I guess, uh, required by the federal government. There are other alternatives that could be pursued, which... I believe um, you folks are, are starting to look at, uh, but for right now, this is our um, reimbursement approach, an actual cost reimbursement approach. And some other uh, objectives of the cost report, one is to compute the cost per unit for each service function, um, and that is what is then used to determine how much uh, is Medi-Cal versus non-Medi-Cal um, and to apportion the cost between the two. Uh, based on the same cost per unit of service for treatment services. Uh, you also identify the sources of funding um, on the cost report. And then it, the cost report itself serves as the basis for your uh, year-end cost settlement, focus reviews, and subsequent Medi-Cal um, fiscal audits, as, as we already said. And, and one critical thing to understand about the cost report is that you go through the year, through a, a fiscal year, providing services. And so the costs need to align with the provision of those services. And so um, you really want to make sure that whatever services you're reporting in the cost report, that you have the corresponding costs of providing those, um, those services. And so, again, now getting into kind of an overview of, um, of the, the cost report itself, um, the, the cost report actually is multiple uh, Excel files or workbooks um, that are really a, more of a cost report package. Um, and every county mental health plan uh, is required to prepare one. And, that, and within that package, you have a summary cost report and every county should only have one summary cost report. And then you have detailed cost reports for each legal entity um, that is providing services within the county. Uh, the summary cost report itself, um, you really don't have to do much with. It uh, basically compiles all the data from the detailed cost reports. The only thing you have to add is your Mental Health Services Act funding. Um, and expenditures uh, on one of the forms. And then in prior years, we had to report on the use of state general fund monies when you had a managed care allocation or you had AB 3632 funding. Um, the summary cost report was where you uh, demonstrated the use of those funds 
We don't currently have that, um, and so you're not really required to do anything with that. Uh, but we may in some future do that. And then there's the detailed cost report, um, which is again required to be provided by each legal entity, which is both the contract providers and uh, county operated providers. Um, and it really then forms the basis for determining the reimbursement for each or by legal entity. The, the other caveat to that is that, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, the county needs to incur a certified public expenditure in order to obtain reimbursement. So if you have a contract provider who incurs costs over and above what the county has paid them, uh, the state will more than likely adjust that back to what you actually incurred in terms of certified public expenditures to that provider. Um, and so it, it's their detailed cost report is used to determine the FFP, but it may get adjusted based on what you actually um, what you actually paid uh, paid the provider. Um, the the other part too, you know, and this is kind of what I think is a very gray area is what you know who or which legal entities are required to prepare cost reports um, and you know, obviously, any legal entity that provides Medi-Cal services, you, you know, you need to have their cost report. Um, but some of the, the the legal entities that are not providing Medi-Cal services, um, and, and it's, again, it's kind of a gray area. And I've, I've heard in some instances where, um, you know, a cost report analyst at the state will require uh, basically, you know, cost reports from every um, entity that provides any sort of service. Um, and, and really, the, the real gray area, again, is like the IMDs and the board and cares that are not providing Medi-Cal services. Um, and so, you know, whether you decide to have them prepare a cost report or somehow you've got to back their costs out of your cost or your payments to them out of your cost report because the services aren't in there. Um, but it, it really more than likely depends on the analysts that you're dealing with at the state. Um, I think, and there's pros and cons as well. Uh, when we talk about administration and how you allocate that, um, you know, pulling, so for sure pulling them out and getting the costs out of your cost report um, is important. And you don't want to then include, for example, you know, some of the, the board and care costs as if they were provided by the county um, because it may have a detrimental impact on your administrative reimbursement. Um, but again, I, you know, personally, I, I would say to try to get away with as few cost reports as possible. You for sure need it for the Medi-Cal legal entities, um, but for the other ones, whether you end up preparing a cost report for each one um, or the alternative, like I said, is just to back their costs out as an adjustment. Uh, which is a lot easier um, than having to do a cost report for each one. So why don't I stop there? Are, are there any cost or questions on kind of some of this overview stuff before we start getting into details? No questions yet. Okay. Um, so the detail cost report, uh, you know, so here you're reporting costs and revenues that should come directly from your uh, financial system. And again, you know, it, it's really important to align the costs with the actual services that were delivered during the fiscal year. So you're making adjustments to get to what those actual costs are. Um, and really the, the two, well, the three uh, main ones are, you know, doing a payroll reconciliation. You may have some accruals and stuff like that that you need to address. Um, and then also adjusting your operating expenses uh, to really reflect what which what was incurred uh, during the fiscal year, irrespective of the timing of the payment. Um, and, and then the last thing really is the contractor payments, which is part of that. Uh, and that you know th those uh, exercises really are what um, take a lot of time in terms of getting the the costs accurate to be reported on the cost report. And so 
there's a lot of work that goes into that when you're preparing the cost report, but it's really, really important to align again the services with the costs. Um, and then as, as part of the detailed cost report, you're backing out your payments to, uh, to the contractors. Again, because you're not showing services, their services on your cost report, so you need to pull out the, the payments to those uh, providers. Um, and, and also, you know, as, as part of this, uh, the amount that you pay the contractor um, doesn't have to equal exactly their cost. I know that the cost report analysts at the state like that to be the same, um, but you may have a policy where you don't recoup from contractors if, if you overpay them or there's a threshold, say, you know, $1,000 or something that you're just not going to go after them and, and recoup, especially um, if it's a non-Medi-Cal service. Um, so really, again, it, it, what you're reporting or what you're backing out is what's in your GL, which doesn't necessarily equal um, what is on the contractor's cost report. And then you also need to make adjustments uh, based on Medicare principles of reimbursement. And really the three main ones that I see, so lobbying expenses are, are not allowed. And so there's a portion of your CBHDA dues that, are, that go towards lobbying. Um, and every year CBHDA issues a letter uh, to the counties, to you folks, telling you what percent of the dues you need to exclude as lobbying expenses. So you back those out. Um, you may have to make an adjustment for your fixed assets and then the associated depreciation amount. Um, Medi-Cal or Medicare requires uh, that um, fixed assets be uh, depreciated. The, the financial level um, of what constitutes uh, an asset that needs to be depreciated, I think is pretty much left up to whatever the county's policies are. I know it used to be about $5,000, but if you have a specific, more than likely your auditor controller has a specific um, dollar amount that uh, they, then any purchase above that requires the asset to be depreciated. Um, and so you need to make adjustments for depreciation, which could be positive or negative. Um, you know, you could be backing out the, if the expense was incurred in the fiscal year, you'd be pulling it out and then just adding back in the, de the depreciation amount. And then in subsequent years, you would be adding depreciation um, over the life of the asset. And then there's also self-insured workers' compensation. So if you're a county who is self-insured um, for workers' compensation, you're required to back out the, the premium payments and you're allowed to include uh, the actual claims paid for work and workers' compensation. So um, those are probably the three main ones uh, that I have, have seen. Um, here's where you find the, the detail for the Medicare principles of reimbursement. If you go to cms.gov and, and go through this, you end up um, at their list. Uh, this is the provider reimbursement manual and the different uh, chapters. The one, it's called cost related to patient care. Um, that one goes through and uh, provides a lot of, you know, costs that are not allowed, et cetera, um, so that you can uh, determine if, if there's other adjustments that you need to make. Um, then the other part of the, the detailed cost report uh, represents your units of service. Um, that should come directly from your claims processing system. And I know a lot of you small counties are on Anasazi. Um, and it's, it's total units as well as the Medi-Cal units. And then Medi-Cal units are broken out by different, uh, what we would call Medi-Cal programs, which are regular Medi-Cal, Medi-Medi. Um, and then you've got some enhanced uh, programs like refugee, pregnancy, um, some of the children's services, you have the Affordable Care Act. Um, so you've got all these different programs that you've got to break out uh, for the Medi-Cal units. Um, and that should come uh, directly from 
your claims processing system. And then the Medi-Cal units ideally are reconciling back to the 835 file for actual approved units um, because that's ultimately what you're going to be audited on. All right, any questions on that stuff? Nope. Um, there is, Jane Adcock had her hand raised, so let me just uh, take her off mute. Um, Jane, did you, you have a question? Me? Yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry, Mike, a few slides back, um, you had indicated where the counties would report the sources of income and they, or yeah, uh, sources of funding, and it uh, included MHSA. Yeah. Yes. Summary. What about the block grant and 1991 and 2011 realignment funds? So those those are all reported on the detailed cost report, and then it rolls oh. up into the summary cost report. Okay. Um, you don't have to, so there is nowhere in the cost report that you report the amount of any of those funding sources you just mentioned, um, in primarily 91 and 2011 realignment, how much you received. Um, all you do is really report how much you used to fund your services. Oh, MHSA okay. is a little, yeah, MHSA is a little different in that they want you to also show how much you received and how much interest you earned. Okay. But so when you're showing how, what what monies you spent to cover the services for the year, it, it does embody all of the fund sources. Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, cool. That's all I was, wanted to know. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. There's another hand raised. Just a second. All right, uh, Maria Ona. Maria, do you have a question? Hi, Mike. Um, this is regarding the payments to contractors on MH nineteen sixty three. You mentioned yes. that it, you mentioned that it should be um, um, equal to what is on the GL. But if the state analyst is insisting that it has to be equal to what is on the contractor's cost report. How do we move forward then? So, so there's two ways to really deal with that. Um, again, first of all, your, your analyst is wrong, um, unfortunately. And unfortunately, well, I, I was going to say a lot of the folks are new and, and they don't understand um, any of this. Uh, but I think even the older ones didn't really understand it. Um, and for somewhere along the line, the state has said these two have to tie or, or they've got a, an edit. Um, usually, when if you provide an explanation as to why they're different, the analyst will accept it, and then you can just deal with the auditor. But if they're not willing to do that, there, there's two things you can do. One is if the provider's costs are in excess of what you paid them, you can either make an adjustment on the 1992 on line two to lower their cost to what you actually paid them. You could show it. You could also show the, the well, that would then get them to equal. I was going to say you could show it as other revenue as well, but you still have the discrepancy. Um, so that's what you would do if the contractor's costs are in excess of what you paid them. If it is a pure Medi-Cal provider, you may want to do an adjustment um, on the 1962 to say to adjust to county's payments so that the FFP is solely based on what you paid the provider. Um, so that would be another way to deal with a, a contractor whose costs are in excess of what you paid them. If the contractor's costs are less than what you paid them, um, you, again, you would probably go to the 1962 and do some sort of uh, write-off, basically, saying, you know, for excess payments to contractors or um, somehow like that, uh, so that you could have the 1963 equal what you what is shown on the contractor's cost report, but then you'd have a subsequent adjustment to adjust your cost to exclude the overpayment. So those are 
basically the two ways to get them to match. But again, that the, <laughs> they shouldn't have to match. Um, and in fact, it makes no sense if you really think about it. Um, what's <laughs> what's the probability that, that these interim payments that you make throughout the year are going to equal exactly what you paid a contractor and, and uh, I mean, uh, equal exactly what their costs are. Um, but for some reason, the, the analysts continue to try to push that. Um, so those are, those are ways that you can address it to meet the analyst needs, but still keep your cost report accurate. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about direct versus indirect costs. Um, and this is something that changed in 10-11 uh, based on a CMS. The feds conducted a financial management review of, of the state and of this cost report and found that the state was not actually treating indirect costs appropriately. Um, Prior to 1011, uh, all indirect costs were basically included as administration. But with, beginning in 1011, and based on the financial management review, um, and with DHCS policy letter 11-01, uh, you're now required to um, spread indirect costs uh, among the cost centers that receive a benefit from those indirect costs. Um, and so you can look at um, Let's see, the A87, if you really want to go through the detail, there's, it's a lot of pages, but kind of the, again, the bottom line is you're trying to get to um, spreading the cost appropriately based on the benefit received from, from the cost center. So costs are now identified as either direct costs, from, and this is from your GL, and those are costs that can be directly identified with a specific cost objective. and and there are really three cost objectives in the, the cost report. One is services, um, both treatment and non-treatment services. Uh, then you also have administration, which is administration of the mental health plan. And then there's utilization review activities and costs. Um, and what we call, what, what a cost that's direct means that it's solely related to one of those three cost objectives. Um, for a lot of small counties, uh, you're probably not going to have a ton of direct costs, meaning you've got clinicians, yeah, they're providing services, but a lot of them also do utilization review activities. So um, really their, uh, their costs um, and their activities are, 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 need to be spread between those different uh, cost centers. The other thing is that direct costs are not the same as direct service costs. We used to, the cost report used to say direct service costs, um, which really is the mental health services. Uh, that's not the same as direct costs. And then indirect costs, like I said, those are the costs that are incurred for a common or joint purpose, benefiting more than one of these activities. Um, the way I generally look at it, these are costs that are incurred because you're the county versus being the county mental health plan. Um, so like you, you've got HR costs, you've got procurement costs, you've got legal costs. Um, but again, you you know, for small counties where maybe you have one facility um, and that facility you're doing multiple types of activities, that then even the facility costs all become indirect costs that, that need to be allocated. Um, but in any case, I, I would, uh, refer you to this DMH policy letter um, 1101, uh, which goes through um, back in September 2011, which provides more detail, um, and then again talks about direct costs, um, and then indirect costs, and talks about how indirect costs must be allocated to the three different um, different cost objectives. Um, so that's direct and indirect. The other thing is, um, again, the, the goal is to try to distribute these costs based on the benefit received from the cost center. Um, in general, you know, I think most folks use salaries and benefits 
uh, as the basis for distributing um, the indirect costs. Uh, you can also have an indirect indirect cost rate plan, which again, A87 goes through how to put one of those together. Um, so uh, that's direct versus indirect costs. Any questions on that? No questions. All right. Um, and so then again, uh, you're identifying the direct cost by the different cost center. And I think the one thing, again, that, that's a little different is, is this administration, which is really supposed to relate to administration of the mental health plan based on that, that DMH policy letter and talks about some of the activities that they call um, administration. Um, and so it's, it's different how you may be organized uh, internally. And so you may have a unit or division or section that's called administration. Um, a lot of times that does not necessarily correlate with the definition of administrative costs per, um, per the cost report. So keep that in mind um, as you're, you're going through the cost report that it isn't necessarily everything you call administration. And, and again, part of the way I look at it is if you were a clinic, would you incur those type of costs? Or is it a cost that you incur because you're the mental health plan? And if it's a cost you incur because you're the mental health plan, then it's administrative. Um, then administrative costs are separated on the cost report into the different um, categories uh, or programs, whatever you want to call them, um, which currently, at least for 1718, included you know just regular Medi-Cal, um, healthy families, and, and included in regular Medi-Cal is going to be uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, the M-CHIP, which is is the enhanced kids stuff. Um, then there's non-Medi-Cal, and then there are the administrative costs complying with the continuum care reform. Um, and those are identified because you can get some state general fund reimbursement for those. And, and they basically give you three different approaches to identify those. And again, this, um, so one of which is a uh, percentage of program beneficiaries of the population served by the county, or you can use relative values, which is a weighting of, of units based on charges. Um, or you can use the gross costs. The auditors really like gross costs because the the first two, unless you have, um, so for example, for relative value, the, the auditors expect you to allocate some of your administrative costs to uh, non-treatment activities, such as, um, you know, if you're doing outreach and, and mode 45 type activities, or if you're doing client supports, and more of the mode 60 type activities, the auditors expect to see some administrative costs allocated to those uh, non-Medi-Cal activities. Um, and if you don't have units and charges, then you can't use the relative value um, because you would not be allocating any uh, administrative costs to those modes. Same with the percentage of program beneficiaries. And this one has, has changed, and, and I don't even know if the state really has it right yet um, because in the uh, in the actual provider manual they say that um, the percentage of program beneficiaries of the population served by the county this is the number of units of service of the beneficiaries for each program divided by total units of service um, so that's not units of time that's units of service so that'd be like client contacts and again that um, so that would potentially be okay, um, and especially if you then count or track client contacts for your, like I said, your your outreach and engagement type activities and your um, client support activities. So it's, th this one, th the easiest thing to do is gross costs, which to be honest with you, a lot of times it's just easier to do that. You don't have to deal with it at audit. But it's also not necessarily the the best, um, the most beneficial to the county in terms of reimbursement. Uh, this percentage of program beneficiaries generally would be, um, and it's just then a matter of convincing the auditor that your approach uh, adequately um, 
allocated the administrative cost between the different programs. And then for utilization review, um, luckily we don't have that same issue as much, uh, but you have what are personnel, which are uh, skilled professional medical personnel, which is what SPMP stands for. Then you have um, the non-SPMPs uh, that are doing Medi-Cal activities, and then you have non-Medi-Cal um, utilization review activities. And since you only do utilization review for treatment uh, services, you don't have to worry about the mode 45 and the mode 60 issue. So here you can, um, you, uh, here the gross cost actually just within your treatment modalities uh, generally works out pretty well. Um, or you can again use uh, use client contacts or um, unduplicated clients to um, allocate costs. The one thing though with the with the SPMP, um, uh, you want to take a look at DMH um, letter 0511 that that kind of goes through the requirements for um, for the SPMPs. And, and just as a heads up, the the auditors generally have interpreted this when the definition of the cost of SPMP need to be directly identified. And so they're saying basically you cannot allocate any indirect costs to um, to the SPMP category. And then direct service costs, which are allocated to modes of service, um, which are 24-hour care, day services, um, outpatient services, and then, like I said, your your outreach type things and um, your client supports, mode 60. Um, and then for the treatment uh, services and treatment modalities, costs are apportioned between Medi-Cal and non-Medi-Cal based on units of service. So in other words, you come up with a, a cost per unit or cost per minute, um, and then the uh, that based on total services delivered, multiplied times the units or minutes that were Medi-Cal, and that determines um, how you apportion the cost between Medi-Cal and non-Medi-Cal. Um, and then we, we still have this lower of cost or charges comparison, and if you look at the provider reimbursement manual uh, for CMS, they actually have that in there. Um, and so, it, but it's an aggregate comparison where, but separately inpatient uh, from non-inpatient services. Um, but the one thing that changed, um, and, and this was right around when the state was allowing you to submit the supplemental claims for costs incurred above your reimbursement um, for uh, basically from January 1st through 11-12, um, they've factored into the cost report that the county legal entities are entitled to actual costs. Um, meaning if you, on the cost report where it says, um, is this a county legal entity report? If you click on yes, um, then it's going to default to give you your actual costs, which is great. And it should have been that way uh, for a long time um, so that you don't have to go through and, and compare uh, costs to charges. Um, just a couple of other things on the detailed cost report. You, you are, even though we don't, we used to have a schedule of maximum allowances, which again was part of that supplemental payment, um, where you were able to get reimbursement above the SMAs. Those were a state imposed limit uh, that went away in 1112, I believe, or 1213. So we no longer have the, the maximum allowances other than for what they call the the um, admin days in inpatient facilities, uh, but but what didn't go away is this administrative cost limited, which is limited to no more than 15% of your Medi-Cal direct service costs. Um, and there's a couple of parts to this too. So uh, you want to include all your contract provider Medi-Cal direct service costs um, when you figure out that limit, and then you also want to pick up all the inpatient uh, direct service costs, um, including the gross payments to fee-for-service Medi-Cal hospitals. Um, this, for some reason, has been an issue now 
with some of the cost report analysts where they don't understand this and they're looking for support in your cost report uh, as to how you came up with the number that you're including um, for inpatient direct services. Uh, so hopefully they get some education. Um, and if, if you get pushback saying, uh, why did you include that? It, it is allowable. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure you include that, especially if you're bumping up against the 15% limit. And, and the other, um, a lot of counties, the, the easiest way to try to figure out your gross payments for fee-for-service Medi-Cal hospitals is to take your managed care offsets and multiply it times two or divide it by 0.5. Um, that actually is very conservative because that would not include any of the um, any of the fee-for-service hospital payments that are for Affordable Care Act clients, for example, um, which you would not see any sort of offset for. So ideally, you, you're tracking it through your, your treatment authorization request system, and that is a better place to get that number. Um, but at least if you include, you know, doubling of your managed care offsets, it's um, it's something, but it's still, like I said, it's conservative. And then, um, you know, on, on the MH 1992, that's where everything kind of comes together. Um, you've got your total costs, and then you need to show how those costs were funded. Um, and so this is where you're reporting on the 1991 realignment, 2011 realignment, um, MHSA, to the extent MHSA funds were used, any of your grant funding that was used. Uh, on this form, the, the Medi-Cal and the, um, the match for the ACA, which is state general funded, those are automatically calculated um, based on your inputs into the cost report. But all the rest, and uh, you have to report on. Um, you have to go ahead and put it into the cost report. So that's a detailed cost report. Are there any questions? No questions. All right. So the the summary cost report, like I said earlier, it it really just rolls up all these detailed cost reports into a, into a summary file. Um, and so you've got to make sure you follow the naming instructions um, that are in the, the cost report instruction manual. Um, and you want to have everything in the same file or folder um, when you run it, because it there's actually a macro in the summary file that goes in, opens up each of these detailed cost reports and pull, pulls, in the, um, pulls in the information. Um, then, like I said earlier, you have to add some additional data on your MHSA funding. And, and this is where the certification is that you need to have your mental health director and your um, auditor controller sign saying everything's true and correct. So that's, that's kind of the cost report itself. Um, so talking a little bit about uh, the, the settlement process and, and actually, so you're required to submit the cost report by December 31st. Um, so six months after the close of the fiscal year. Ideally, when you do that, your total costs and your total units need to be accurate. You may not have all the Medi-Cal approved units yet um, because you've got additional time to get those services approved. So that isn't as important. Um, but it is important that by the time you're done with your quote B file, that um, your total costs and total units are accurate. And so as probably most of you know who have submitted a cost report, you, you go ahead and upload it to ITWS, um, and then you get error reports. Some of them are false errors, some are true errors that you have to fix. Often, it seems like one of the, the main issues has to do with a legal entity not having a service function open to that legal entity. Um, and so then you have to go through MedCCC to get uh, a given service, and, and a lot of times those are non-Medi-Cal service functions like um, Mode 60, Service Function Code 78 for client supports. Um, anyway, you, you get through that, um, your cost report analyst reviews it, you answer whatever questions you need to answer, um, and then they say, okay, we're ready to reconcile, they give you an F file. You then have 90 days um, to make changes to the F file, and, and really what you're changing 
would be any Medi-Cal unit to service. So if you've subsequently had additional services approved, you would make sure and include those. And then you would make adjustments to the revenues based on um, any sort of adjustments to the Medi-Cal unit to service. And then the initial cost report that you submitted back in December, six months following the close of the fiscal year, that does not result in any sort of settlement payment. It's, it's this reconciliation process that results in either a payment or an amount due from the county based on the cost report. The one thing though, just as a heads up, the, the state does not look at your units of service. They, it's really just comparing, here's how much your cost report shows you're entitled to, here's how much the state thinks they paid you for that fiscal year, if there's a difference, then the state pays you, either the state pays you or you pay the state, depending on which way it goes. Um, so they are not at that point comparing state approved units of service to the county approved units of service. And so there's really three main reasons why you could receive a settlement payment. Um, if your cost per unit uh, is actually higher than the interim rate that you were claiming at, then yeah, you're, you're going to get um, additional funding. Um, you also could have more Medi-Cal units that you're including in the cost report that DHCS has paid you for. So they're showing fewer approved units than what you're showing. And then what was, um, and probably still is somewhat, uh, especially with small counties, a lot of counties do not fully or claim at all for Medi-Cal administration and or utilization review during the fiscal year. And they wait for cost report settlement to, to get paid for those activities. Um, that's not advisable because you're shorting yourself and, and again, the, the process just takes forever. Um, so ideally, you want to start submitting, uh, I think the UR claims are quarterly and the, and the admin, actually it's the office, I think admin's quarterly, UR's monthly or can be quarterly, but, but you're better off to submit those claims, the 1982 um, B and C forms during the year to get reimbursed for your costs um, rather than waiting till settlement. But anyway, those those are the three main uh, reasons for actually getting a payment. Um, and obviously, if you, if you could actually owe money back if um, the, the converse happens. So if you had uh, cost per unit was less than your interim rate, you have less units than what DHCS is showing as approved, or you overclaim for administration utilization review. And lastly, um, I wanted to point out uh, the state, and, and I, part of the reason even for doing this today, the state's really hammering on these settlements. They're trying to get caught up. Um, and so from a workload perspective, I, I think you guys are probably um, getting a lot of correspondence from your cost report analyst. Uh, trying to get the F files done, trying to get the settlement done. And you can see here that um, basically this calendar year, they are intending to settle six fiscal years of cost reports. And then shortly into the next calendar year, uh, settle um, 1718, at which point they would be caught up. So uh, after you go through all this, um, the state then uh, pursuant to statute, has three years to either audit your cost report or accept it as submitted. Um, and it's three years from your most recently filed amended cost report is the way the statute uh, reads. And there's really a couple of issues or areas that they look at. One is units of service, um, and this is probably the biggest one, where they want to compare their records to your records, um, and they expect you to be able to support uh, your unit to service with county records. Because we're dealing with some super old years, um, 10, 11, 11, 12, um, a lot of you have changed systems and so you no longer have the capacity to go back and extract reports, which is um, really, really a shame. So think of that as you go forward, making sure that you're documenting your unit to service and the reports um, in detail uh, so that when you get audited, you have the support for those units of service. The other thing is the state uses the lowest of your records or the state records, and they do that individually by service function um, and by each of the different programs. So um, it, it's 
again, it's it's not a, a great situation, but um, their argument is that if you don't have support or they may adjudicate a service and approve a service that you're not showing as approved, so that's why they would use your records. Um, they would use their records saying you may be overstating um, in your uh, records, and so they're going to go for what they've approved. Some other areas to um, to think about is, is in some of the areas that we've seen, uh, like I talked about before, the allocation of administrative costs between Medi-Cal and non-Medi-Cal. Um, you know, they really focus on that. So make sure you've got support for whatever you're doing. Um, allocation of indirect costs to the SPMP utilization review. Again, uh, they generally, the auditors don't like it um, because they, they refer to that letter that says the costs have to be directly identified. Uh, allocation of direct service cost to modes and service functions. One of the things here, um, and especially with the elimination of the SMAs and with increased MHSA type of non-treatment activities, um, you really want to make sure there's a correlation between the cost that you're calling treatment costs and what you're showing as units of service. So if you've got a staff member um, that you're saying is mode 15 outpatient services, treatment services, and yet that person has no activity in your um, claims processing system, you need to be able to support why you're including them as mode 15. And it could be that all you do at a given clinic is treatment services. And this is, for example, the, the receptionist at that clinic, that that's legitimate. Um, but just be prepared to support that at audit. And then what seems to be the biggest thing that I'm seeing across counties right now is this uh, issue where a county shows many, many units or the state shows that the county has many, many units, which are Medicare, Medi-Cal units of service, where the client's Medicare and, and as well as Medi-Cal, and yet you have no offsetting revenue um, to relate to those services. And really, um, you are required to bill Medicare for, prior to billing Medi-Cal, um, for certain services. Uh, but really, there, there's a bunch of services that you aren't required to do that through, such as case management and um, crisis intervention. You're also not required to do it for a bunch of practitioner types. Um, and really, the only ones that are eligible are, are your psychiatrists, psychologists, and LCSWs. Um, your MFTs, you're not required to bill. So, um, and the way that the state defines medi medi units is really based on the client, not the service and not the rendering provider and also not the setting. So uh, in any case, just be prepared that if you are showing medi medi units on your cost report, you either need to show that you, um, that the medi medi units uh, really are not eligible for Medicare, in which case you may have to go through and, and show the, the taxonomy to the auditor. Or if you do have medi medi units that were billed to Medicare and you receive payment, you need to show those as offsetting revenue on the Schedule B and reduce your um, your Medi-Cal reimbursement. So that, that seems to be one hot issue that, that the auditors are really focused on right now. So um, I didn't think this was going to take this long, but that is the uh, cost report. Are there any questions on anything? Um, Janet Eng has a question. Let me... Um, unmute her. Janet, do you have a question? Janet, are you there? We can't hear you if you're speaking. No, maybe not. All right. Other than Janet, that was that's all the questions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to have to go pretty quick because we, we don't have a ton of time. On the revenue and expenditure report, um, you know, you're required to do this uh, based on regulations. Um, and historically, DHS has issued, you know, the template and instructions. It's changed from year to year. One thing I want to make sure, and, I, and I've got a link later in here, uh, DHS does now have some proposed uh, fiscal regulations for the MHSA. 
um, and they're referencing the form and the format in those regulations. Um, and so you, you probably want to take a look at that. Uh, the one thing, unlike the cost report, where there really isn't a penalty for being late, other than at least at this point, um, DHCS will withhold 25% of your future MHSA distributions if you don't include uh, the complete and accurate revenue and expenditure report by December 31st. Um, they go through the purpose, which you can see here, uh, and something new that, that we just had added was you've got to start reporting on veterans services, which is just going to be, one, it looks like it's going to be one number um, across all components, so at least you're not having to do any detail on it. Uh, but really, from my perspective, it seems like reversion is really the focus of the purpose of the revenue and expenditure report um, and looking at unexpended funds or, or determining the amount of unexpended funds. I, I'm not sure how much true evaluation has gone on, um, you know, based on information submitted. A uh, couple of things, all the expenditures that you're reporting on the revenue and expenditure report, or at least the use of the MHSA funds, need to be consistent with either your three-year program and expenditure plan, your annual update or other update. And you want to report on the revenue and expenditure report your total costs for each of these programs, irrespective of, of the funding. So um, because it allows you to say, here's how much of that program was funded with MHSA, Here's how much was, for example, Medi-Cal FFB. Here's how much you could even augment an MHSA program with 91 realignment if you wanted to. And then in general, you know, I suggest trying to do the, the cost report first um, so that you can figure out your Medi-Cal before doing the uh, revenue and expenditure report. However, given that there's penalties associated with the revenue and expenditure report, that often doesn't occur. Um, and, but it, ideally, you, you would be going in that order, do the, the cost report, and then flow that into the revenue and expenditure report. Um, the uh, report itself, you, for each of the different components, um, you're reporting uh, costs separately for planning, evaluation, and administration. Um, the, the one uh, thing that's a little unique is for innovation. You have individual administration and evaluation for each project. Um, the, the other thing on this, it's the description of indirect costs and how to to address those or, or allocate those um, is somewhat ambiguous or confusing, I think, in their instructions. Uh, it's unclear whether you're supposed to allocate indirect costs to each of the individual programs for the components. Um, so, or versus just leaving it as administration. Uh, if it is intended to be consistent with the cost report, then you should be allocating it. Um, but again, it, the, the instructions are somewhat confusing. So I'm, I'm not sure what the state's really asking for there. And, and the other downside, anytime something is vague and ambiguous, um, it's left up to the auditor to make their own interpretation. Um, and that's usually where we get into a lot of trouble. Um, and the state does as well because the auditors don't necessarily use common sense. They're looking for, you know, black and white in terms of uh, what they read, and then they make an interpretation, and and you end up in appeal. Anyway, um, transfers to joint powers authority, or you report those as well, but then you also have to report the expenditures incurred by the JPA because now the state's saying that the funds are not considered expended until the JPA incurs. The actual expenditure. You also report transfers between CSS and the other components, um, as well as the prudent reserve. Um, for workforce education and training and the capital facilities technological needs and prudent reserve, the Act specifies that you're limited to 20% of your five year average allocation. They're also now, and it's actually in the Act, so it's not new. Um, but the state's providing some guidance around how you can transfer CSS to PEI. Um, and it's really when you can demonstrate that the increased funding for PEI will result in a de decreased need for and costs for additional services. So it has to be cost effective to transfer CSS to PEI. And this is also all in these proposed regs. 
Um, and then you report the costs by program, project, funding category, um, depending on uh, the given the given component. Um, they also allow for adjustments to prior year MHSA expenditures, as well as your Medi-Cal reimbursement. Um, you're no longer, so you, you can go through and if you ended up incurring additional MHSA expenditures because of a Medi-Cal settlement or just, or audit finding that disallowed Medi-Cal reimbursement, you you can make those adjustments on the revenue and expenditure report in, in the subsequent year, rather than having to revise every uh, revenue expenditure report in a prior year. We no longer report your distributions on the um, RER. Uh, and so as a result, the, the revenue and expenditure report doesn't show your unspent funds. So you need to maintain records. Um, but then DHCS is going to calculate reversion based on your expenditures and interest that you report on the revenue and expenditure report. And then also the distributions reported by the state controller's office, not on a case basis, but on a cash basis. Um, and there's the link for the state controller's office. The one thing, again, the state looks at um, the fiscal year based on when you receive the payment not when funds are deposited in the fund, which is how the state controller's office reports. So there's a difference of a month um, in the fiscal year. So you can't just look at, for example, fiscal year 17-18 on the, the SCO's office um, would not have uh, the amount that the state's going to use. And then lastly, the reversion process. Um, and again, here's a link to these new proposed regulations that would uh, put into regulation the, the reversion process, which says DMH is, DHCS is going to determine the amount of reverted funds within 30 days of receipt of a complete and accurate revenue and expenditure report. You then have 30 days to appeal, and then DHCS will notify you within 45 days uh, whether they disapprove or approve the appeal. I mean, really what they've set this up to be is you can only appeal basically calculations um, because that's all they're doing. It, it's kind of, they, they're setting in regs how this thing is calculated um, and they're just going to mechanically do that calculation. Uh, the one thing that the regs did not have is any sort of, um, any sort of uh, audit process and or audit appeal process. So hopefully there will be additional fiscal regs that provide a better appeal process than the one that is used to appeal the revenue and expenditure report. In terms of some audit issues, just to you know keep in mind as, as you're doing the revenue and expenditure report, you know the, the non-supplant provisions are in, in regulation and they've been in regulation for a while now. Um, you are required to expand services beyond what was in existence and you can't supplant funding that was required to be used for services in 0405. Um, so it, it's not like the supplant looks at what you did last year. It actually goes back to 0405. Um, and then you can't use uh, MHSA for costs associated with inflation for the programs and services that were in existence. So if you basically had the same program that was in existence on November 2nd, 2004, you know, obviously it's probably going to cost more to fund that same program. You can't use MHSA for the inflationary costs associated with that program. But what you can do is augment that program and add elements to that program with MHSA funds, as well as you can pay for inflationary costs associated with MHSA programs. So I don't want to scare you with the inflation thing there. Um, you know, Again, everything that you incur for MHSA needs to tie back to your plan. So uh, you want to be able to demonstrate how a given expenditure ultimately relates back to your plan. Um, you should not be limited to the budget amounts in the plan, uh, but it should be looked at the program and the services and the description. The, the one exception to that is innovation, where the OAC, Oversight and Accountability Commission, has um, authority to approve everything that's spent on innovation. Uh, and so you do need to, to be, you are limited to the budget. And if you're going to change your budget, you have to go back to the OAC. 
Um, I believe the OAC still believes that uh, you cannot incur costs for innovation planning without going to the OAC, um, which isn't necessarily the way the, the I don't believe the act's written. Um, but in any way, innovation is just a little bit different than the rest of of the um, components. You know, obviously, you're, you should be tracking against reversion. Um, you know, most of you small counties, you now have five years, at least uh, the smaller of the small counties if you're under 200,000 population. Um, but you definitely want to be, be cognizant of that. Um, as well as, you know, identification of the other revenues. Uh, and strategically how you want to report those and, and um, how you show those on the revenue and expenditure report. I apologize we went a little long. Um, are there any questions on the on the revenue and expenditure report? There are a few questions, but because we went long, I'll I'll just send those questions to you directly and you okay. can respond. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Sorry we went long. Yeah, Next I apologize. April 26th. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.